Taskies, a super brand, a Kenyan legacy. The mention of Taskies supermarkets brings back memories to many. The green branded superstores, strategically situated in major towns and estates. Inside, a huge portrait of the founder in his trademark cardigan hung on the wall near the customer care desk. Many have the nostalgia of shopping along the neat aisles with friendly attendants ready to assist. Most popular were the food parlors that served fresh traditional foodstuffs. And who can forget the tantalizing aroma of the pastries at the in-house bakery? This made the weight on the checkout line bearable. The rise and fall of Tusky supermarkets is a case that will be studied by future generations and will draw both inspiration and lessons. On one hand, Tusky's was a magnificent Kenyan brand that epitomized the Kenyan entrepreneurial spirit. Then, on the other hand, Tusky's meteoric rise would end in an even harder fall, leaving casualties all around. So, how and why did Tusky's fall? To most people, and according to the Kenyan media, the main cause of the downfall was family rangos. Tuskies, being a privately owned and family managed enterprise, had numerous instances of family feuds playing out publicly. In one case, two brothers were involved in a fist fight. In another instance, family members ganged up against a non family CEO and chased him out of the office, literally. Yeah, we are small thinkers. Yeah, yeah. I see small thinkers. The second reason for its fall is one where financial crimes were committed, and it is the consequences of these crimes that Tuskies was left high but dry. It is one unknown to many, but one that nonetheless happened. Tuskies' supernormal rise in the early 2000s, moving from five branches to 64, was likely financed by laundered money. As you will see and understand later, Tuskies was at the center of a money laundering cartel. Welcome to the Financial Crimes Podcast. We discuss business, taxes, and the financial crimes perpetrated in boardrooms. If you're into such content, please subscribe, leave a like and a comment. But above all, sit back and enjoy this mini documentary. In the hierarchy of supermarkets in Kenya, Tuskies is the middle child with Nakumat being the big brother and Naivas being the youngest. The relationship between the three supermarkets is more than just for analogy's sake. They all trace their origin in Nakuru and as we'll discover, there is more than meets the eye for Nakumat and Tuskies. In the 1890s, the British shipped into Kenya more than 3,000 Indians to work as laborers for the construction of the railway line to Uganda. Upon completion of the railway line, the majority of the Indians settled in Kenya and were joined by thousands of independent immigrants. As they settled in Kenya, many opportunities arose for convenience stores offering goods sourced from the Indian subcontinent. The Dukawalas, which were operated by individual families, were the roots of Asian economic giants in Kenya. One of the Asian families that had a knack for a retail store were the Shaw brothers, who founded Nakumat. See, when the founders of Nakumat, Atul Shah and his brother, started a retail shop in Nakuru in 1978, they had one loyal employee. His name, Joram Kamau Kago. Joram was born and raised in Rongai, a town 30 kilometers west of Nakuru. Options for careers for the young man from the semi-arid area were limited. And when he found a job at the Nakuru Matris, he was more than settled into that career path. Joram Kamau was a dedicated employee, helping the Indian brothers penetrate through to the Kikuyu customers. In no time, 
na kuru matrices had grown by leaps and Joram Kamau had been promoted to all possible levels until he couldn't be promoted any further. So after seven years, in 1985, and as a sign of good faith, the Shahs helped Joram Kamau start his own wholesale shop. He named it Kitwe General Stores. Joram had a wealth of experience, coupled with the Shah's financial support. This made his shop take the same growth trajectory that Nakuru Matrices had. Joram would later employ his younger brother at the shop, one Peter Mokuhakago. So close was Joram to Atul Shah that he copied Atul's every business move. It was a wise and the right decision. I mean, business is part of the Indian's DNA and the results were positive. The only problem though is that Joram didn't know when to let go of the golden breast that the Shahs had so generously placed on his lips. This is how much he copied the Shahs. Atul Shah operated the business with his brother Nashi M. Shah. Joram copied and brought his brother on board, Peter Kago. Atul Shah named his business Nakuru Mattresses. Joram copied and named his expansion Tasca Mattress. Atul Shah used the elephant as the symbol for his now shortened name, Nakumat. Joram copied and used all the big five animals for his now shortened name, Tuskis. In 1996, the Shah brothers started a bank, Chatterhouse Bank. Well, Joram could not copy that, but the golden teeth was still feeding him. So he became part of the bank by Tuskis becoming a major client, having multiple accounts and moving large amounts of cash. The late 90s and the early 2000s saw the rapid growth and expansion of both Tuskis and Nakumot. It was a welcome supermarket rivalry for the Kenyan economy. Branches were cropping up all over, hundreds of thousands of Kenyans were getting employed, the suppliers had a steady market, and the retail sector of the economy was growing. However, rather unfortunately, Joram Kamau Kago passed on in 2002, bowed out while Tuskis was at its peak. Unknown to him, the storm that was brewing was about to hit the enterprise. The business and his family's lives would be altered forever. At the helm of the business was Mr. Stephen Mokuha, the dad-born son of the founder, Joram Kago. He had taken the reins of the superstore after the father died. Although he was not the natural successor, he was the obvious leader as he had worked with his father since the days of Gateway General Stores. Joram Kago Kamau was the founder and the controlling owner. He had effective personal power over the ownership decisions and prerogative to make unilateral decisions on almost everything that affected the business. But after his death, the business transferred the voting power to the offsprings. This is referred to as sibling partnership. Sibling partnership is in effect a oligopoly of power where decisions are made by the partnership. The siblings shared the company as follows. John Kago owned 10%, Samuel Kamau 17.5%, Stephen Mokuha 14.5%, Yusuf Mugweru 17.5%, George Gashe 10.5%, Mary Njoki 10%, and Monica Njeri 10%. Stephen Mokuha, the dad-born son, was the managing director. John Kago, the firstborn son, was the chairman of the board. Yusuf Mugweru, the fourthborn, was the sales and marketing director, while Sam and the others were board members. Relationships among siblings were often intense and serious conflict occurred. It would turn out to be fatal for the business. 
According to research, approximately half of all sibling partnerships result in split-up, which not only disrupts the management process and business climate, but usually consumes tremendous capital and growth potential as one or more partners are bought out by the other. The conflicts at Tuskies were many. Perhaps the most disgruntled was the fourth-born son, Yusuf Mogueru. In February 2012, after some investigations, Mr. Mogueru raised the alarm over the theft of funds from Tusky's accounts. The accusation saw Mogueru's brothers, Stephen and George, charged with the theft of 1.64 billion shillings from the supermarket chain. Yusuf again subsequently refused to deal that would have seen a strategic investor buy some shares from the company. This further pushed the supermarket into a crisis. His brothers tried to buy him out for 100 million shillings, but he countered their offer. Instead, he instituted winding up procedures for the company. He wanted death of the company by law. Luckily, under the Kenyan laws, winding up can only be done by creditors and not shareholders. Many of the most bitter family feuds, such as the Ho family in Hong Kong and the Macau and the Wang family in Taiwan, result from infighting between multiple wives and children. Further, problems stem from the different attitudes of a younger generation who have often been educated abroad and may not share the grit and the determination of their forefathers. As the tax skis directors aged, they introduced their children to the organization. It was supposed to be the cousins consortium. Cousins with key posts included Omaida Mukuha, the GM for operations, and Anne Omaida Gate, who was an assistant internal auditor. Most of the other cousins were branch managers across the country and held other positions in the company. But the cousin's most famous act was in February 2016. This was after Tuskies had appointed the first non-family member, CEO. Before being elevated to the position of CEO, Dan Gidua was the head of audit in Tuskies for more than four years, while a key director, Steven Mokuha, was the CEO. The grandkids of the founder felt that he, Dan, and the CFO, Daniel Dirango, were mismanaging the organization. While still at Tuskies, Dan Gidua had started his own microfinance and a recruitment firm. This did not sit well with the bona fide heirs, and they had to do what they had to do. Research argued that a general lack of strategic planning and governance in family business has contributed to a high rate of failure among family businesses as they attempt to survive across generations. It seemed the Tuskies family management didn't provide a definition of who they were, a direction of where they were going, and discipline as to how to operate. And they did not also outline the rules of engagement at these intersections. It is rather an intriguing coincidence that when Nakumat started struggling, Tuskies also suffered. But if you have followed the similarities between the two stores, then you'd know it was bound to happen. The same structures that Nakumat so much depended on were the same structures that supported Tuskies. The link on the story of Nakumat and Chattel's bank is on the description. The fall of Chatterhouse Bank was at the center of this pattern. The first recorded case of fishy business happened in 2001 when Chatterhouse Bank received a lump sum amount of 2 billion shillings. It was a humongous amount then as it is now. 
by all senses of the word. To further consolidate how fishy this transaction was, the deposit was made to a small company that owned an eatery in downtown Nairobi, and the depositor was from Leicester. Leicester is a small mountainous European country also known as the billionaire's tax haven. It supports global financial fraud by facilitating registration of shell companies and hides identities of their beneficial owners. The transaction was flagged by the Kenyan authorities, but nothing further was done. This was the start of money laundering by Chesterhouse Bank. It was in 2003 that Chatterhouse Bank hired an internal auditor, Peter Odiambo. After a year of working there, he observed that the bank was not formed for purposes of being a bank. He said, and I quote, My experience at Chatterhouse Bank and as the internal auditor convinced me that the bank was not established to carry out legitimate banking business. In view of this, I became suspicious of over 70% of the total number of accounts maintained by this bank. In this regard, I provided KRE the whole database of Chathouse Bank's accounts totaling to over 200. Within that list, I highlighted 85 accounts which from my analysis had either not paid tax at all or had deliberately declared wrong business turnovers in order to pay less tax." End of quote. He made copies of activity reports for more than 800 suspicious Chatterhouse customer accounts and forwarded them to KRA. But KRA did not act on the information and he forwarded the same to the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission and the Central Bank of Kenya. But a statement from Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission said, quote, money laundering is not a crime in Kenya and cannot be pursued internationally as it is a requirement that the complaining country should have a law in place. The Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act does not provide for money laundering. Therefore, nothing can be done about money laundering allegations." End of quote. In August 2004, the then Finance Minister David Mueraria and Ethics Permanent Secretary John Gidongo constituted the Joint Task Force Investigating Economic Crimes by Chatterhouse Bank and related companies. As usual, this was a hot potato that no one wanted to touch. The whistleblower, Pitol Diambo, had to flee to the USA for fear of his life. The then TBK governor, Dr. Alfred Mulay, was suspended soon after recommending that Chatterhouse Bank's license be withdrawn. And in December 2004, Chatterhouse Bank's archives caught a mysterious fire. Most of the records were smoldered, making subsequent investigations hard to conduct. But the findings of these reports have been summarized in a report called Smoldering Evidence, the Chatterhouse Bank Scandal, which was published by Africa Center for Open Governance, AFRICOG, in 2011. Here is my opinion on how Nakumat, Tuskies, and other companies aided in money laundering at Chathouse Bank. Tuskies operated an account with a balance of 4.3 billion shillings, which was opened in 2001 but was not disclosed until the investigations were done. Its directors operated 75 personal secret accounts with huge balances. It is estimated that Tuskies undeclared sales amounting to between 900 million and 1 billion shillings every year. The self-governing system at Chesterhouse Bank meant that Tuskies could bank its cash and stash it away from its books. Since these accounts were undeclared, KRA had no way of knowing the actual sales and hence the taxes were greatly underdeclared. Second, Tuskies had years of access to cheap funds. These funds were advanced as loans and overdrafts to directors. These loans were ways by Charterhouse Bank to clean money. This is what made it possible for Tuskies 
to grow from five stores in the late 90s to have over 64 branches across East Africa without needing a strategic investor. With assets of about 6 billion shillings, Tuskies had access to loan capital in excess of 100 billion shillings thanks to Chatterhouse Bank. In accounting terms, Tuskies was geared 16 times or 1600% the value of its assets. In layman terms, Tuskies was overly and abnormally financed. Normal gearing should be between 15 and 50 percent. Above that, it shows that the company is risky and its cost of financing is costly. Above 100 percent debt financing means that the company is so much indebted that one market downturn could result in bankruptcy. But to reach a thousand percent, it simply is abnormal, as it means the funding does not follow accounting processes and regular lenders, that is legit banks and investors, would not dare touch or reach those levels. To support my case further, Tusky's profitability margin was 1.2%. That is a profit of one shilling for every 100 shillings in sales. To even an untrained mind in accounting, this level of profitability is not enough to sustain high expansion while at the same time pay directors hefty packs for a soft lifestyle. After the collapse of Chatterhouse Bank in 2006, Tusky's deposits were locked up and the supply of funds was cut off. The CEO of Tusky's then, Mr. Stephen Mokuha, that born son of the founder, Joram Kago was at the helm. He was named after Joram's younger brother, Peter Mokuha. He had taken the reins of the superstore after his father died in 2002. I should mention at this juncture that Joram Kago had later left the gateway business which he had started earlier to his younger brother, Peter Mokuha. And it was with the same ambition that Peter had transformed the store into the now renowned Naivas supermarkets. Peter was however reluctant to follow all of his brother's footsteps and opted for the natural growth and with strategic investors. To him, pole Poland your best. Maybe the reason why Naivas is strong today. Back to Tuskis. By 2010, the chokehold on the finances that they had been used to was now being felt. The many branches had great overheads that the company was struggling to meet. The salaries were in arrears, the rents were in arrears, and most crucially, the suppliers were not being paid. A study on the Kenya retail trade sector prompt payment conducted in June 2017 showed that supermarkets accounted for 92% of debts owed to suppliers. Out of these, 82% was because of three supermarkets, Nakumat, Tuskies, and Uchun. If you ever enjoyed the famous Britannia biscuits and you have been wondering why you do not find them on the shelves anymore, wonder no more. Britannia was a major supplier to Nakumat and Tuskies, and as the two companies collapsed, over 50 million owes to Britannia was lost. Britannia had no choice but to fold and close shop. Other companies that collapsed due to being owed millions were Daraka Honey Bee Products Limited, Natural Salt Manufacturers and Distributors, and many more. Tusky's workers started going on strikes for non-payment of salaries. The shelves started drying up. The pressure was being felt all round, but perhaps the most heat was being felt by the then MD, Stephen Mokuha. 
It was incidental that as the chosen leader, the other siblings looked up to him to maintain the supermarket at the height that they were used to. Perhaps that's the stress he had one morning in February of 2012 when he met with his brother, Yusuf Mugweru Kamau. Though no details of what the meeting was about have emerged, meetings that Yusuf was lamenting at how underfunded his marketing department was. It was then that Stephen reminded him that they were struggling financially. Yusuf, not pleased by that answer, reminded his brother that he had squandered close to 1.6 billion of the family's money by investing it in other companies that belonged to the other siblings. A heated argument ensued, each hitting a crescendo of verbal rejoiders, an unkind word being thrown here and there. Finally, it ended up being a brawl, with Yusuf being the recipient of a few uppercuts and one sucker punch. This ended the quarrel, but ultimately ended up in court. Four years later, in February of 2016, there was drama again as Tuskis. This time, a CEO who had been appointed nine months prior was being ejected. For over 30 years, Tuskies had been run as the family business. After the storm started rocking, they sought the professional services of a management guru. However, as qualified or unqualified as Daniel Gidua was, he could not save the board from sinking. Strategic investors had refused to board unless all the siblings resigned, so the ship was sinking fast. Dan was the scapegoat for the poor performance, and he had to go. In January 2021, Tuskies closed its last branch in Nakuru, Nakuru where it had all started four decades earlier, putting an end to a business empire only in its second generation. Founders, continue resting in peace.